What's good everybody, I'm Keandre, this is Hoopin' Elect, and welcome back to the channel. Now March Madness in the college season officially ended earlier this week with the UConn Huskies taking home the national championship, so shout out to them. Um, they did it in pretty dominant fashion in what was uh, an otherwise wild and unpredictable tournament, but it has been a minute since we did a board. Some things have changed, guys are making their draft decisions um, as the deadline comes up in the next week or so. But yeah, let's go ahead and get into some of those right outside the top 60. But first, a message from the sponsor of today's video, future future is a fitness app that pairs you with your own highly credentialed personal trainer who will build you custom workouts you can complete on your own time and it's something like having a personal trainer right there with you at home when you sign up you'll have a video call with your trainer who will then design a fitness plan unique to you and your needs and whether you're only able to do body weight at home or you want to go to the gym they'll build it into your plan the trainers also message send voice prompts and video check-in calls within the app so you'll feel like they're always by your side and on your team and if you ever get bored or tired of your current plan they are there to change it for you and keep you on track futures trainers have worked with everyone from nba players and other high level hoopers and athletes to your everyday workers so no matter your level they've got you covered if you want to hit your specific fitness goals or just get in a little bit better shape before the summer rolls around future has a great deal waiting on you you use my link you'll get your first month with a future trainer for just 19 dollars so go to tryfuture.co backslash hoop intellect or click the link in the description to get right and reach your fitness goals now it's kind of tough to put this together right now because like we kind of mentioned before we don't know everybody who is going to declare it in return and we've already had the Tyrese Proctors and Riley Kugels go back still waiting on decisions from guys like Adam Bona and Julian Phillips and even some others that are in this top 60. So this could even look a little different by the time that you're watching this but there is still some really intriguing talent here. Obviously, Zach Eady's sheer size and production will get him a shot despite some of his limitations showing up pretty often and in the tournament. Drew Timmy is near the top of this list. Uh, Jacob Toppin has to be mentioned. Naquan Tomlin is super intriguing to me still. Guards like Isaiah Wong, Adam Flagler, Jalen Pickett, Demoy Hodge should all get an opportunity in some fashion in addition to the majority of the other names on this list. So yeah, by the next one of these, it'll be clearer and we'll probably uh, be able to rank them instead of still loosely listing them. Now I had all the usual tiers in this video, but I didn't really like them. I felt like it wasn't adding to the board. So we just kept the ones that do and that I'm more confident in towards the top. And we'll come back with the others down the line. Starting it off at 60, we have UCLA's Jalen Clark. He declared for the draft despite suffering an unfortunate Achilles injury in the conference tournament. There's obviously still a case for him as a top 45 guy, as a defensive player of the year in the Pac-12, an improved shooter and offensive player at 6'5". It'll just be about his medicals and confidence in his full recovery, and of course we won't have a ton of that info, but talent-wise he still needs to be here. Connect on the pass. I mentioned it in my tournament preview, but Jordan Miller was a guy I hadn't given enough attention to this season, and he showed out for Miami in a tournament, playing a big part in getting them to the Final Four. I like his game as an energy forward slash wing, and though he's older as a prospect, I think he's still worth a selection. Washington State's Mo Gay has an intriguing set of skills as a 7-foot big who's an impressive mover, an ever-improving passer and shooter, and his growth this year as a sophomore was great to watch. I think he could be a candidate to return another year and build off of that and try to improve his stock into that late first, early second type of range, but he's already an intriguing project pick in the second right now for me. Baylor Shireman shined for a great Creighton team after spending the first three years of his career at South Dakota State. And while the 6'6 sharp shooting wing isn't the best athlete, he's got good feel, he does some ancillary things well, and should have an opportunity to impress at his second pre-draft run. The case for Kevin McCullen remains the same, a very good wing defender who can make a play and makes all the hustle plays. His shot still hasn't come along how you'd like it, but if it does, he'll be making a significant contribution and I think that's worth the second round pick. Belmont's Ben Shepard is a potential sleeper and a guy I've been able to watch more of recently. He's a 6'6 wing who can really shoot it, he's unselfish and can make a play for others and showed a lot defensively as well. I have the time to watch even more of him soon but he could continue to rise through this pre-draft process and proving that he's able to hang with competition higher than the Missouri Valley. You guys know the case for Armani Bates as a player at this point. He's a talented wing shooter and tough shot maker at 6'9", 6'10", with, you know, concerns in a lot of other areas. He's worth a shot in the mid-second if he can commit to a role and really work defensively. And I still think his talent is worth a shot should he declare. Pull up. 
Kobe Brown's improvement this year was amazing to see. He always produced at a fairly high level in the SEC, but he turned himself into a real NBA prospect, transforming as a shooter, becoming more effective in pretty much every spot, and leading this Missouri team to a very successful year. He's kind of a tweener, but still very skilled and a sneaky good mover, definitely worthy of draft consideration. There have been some rumors of Dayton's Deron Holmes potentially transferring to Duke next season. I'm not breaking anything, that's just a rumor. But of course, being at a school like Duke would give him 100 times the eyes that he's had in the past and possibly increase his stock in the process. Regardless, I still like him this year as one of the better bigs in the class. It's a fluid athlete, improved score, and talented interior defender. Holmes, look at them just. Furman's Jalen Slauson made his presence felt in the tourney, but he had been making NBA draft waves long before that. Now he is older, but his all around game as a wing slash forward who can make plays and defend in multiple spots is more than draftable. Pretty much all the impact metrics love him and I think he'll have a perfect opportunity to be a high riser in the combine and pre-draft process. Tristan Vukcevic doesn't play much in the Euro League, but when he's gotten minutes in the Adriatic League, he's been really solid. I still like him as a long-term play, a 6'10 forward who has real upside as a shooter and playmaker and moves really well at that size. He just turned 19, he may very well end up being a stash pick still, but he's had a whole lot of intriguing moments. For everyone who may not follow the international guys as closely, Nikola Juricic has been on a run lately averaging about 16 points and 5 dimes and shooting the ball at a solid clip from deep. And as a 19 year old who has a knack for making plays at 6'8", I think the draft appeal will be there in a second. Terrence Shannon Jr. had an excellent year for Illinois, and it's finally time that he makes the leap to the NBA. He's an athletic lefty slashing wing who I think made progress as a shooter even though the splits didn't quite show it, and given everything that he brings to the table, he should be a good get somewhere in the second round. Keontae Johnson was huge in bringing Kansas State back into national prominence this year, making the Elite Eight. And considering his health history, it was as big an accomplishment as anything you could have. His size, athleticism, and all-around skill set makes sense on the wing in the second round, even as an older guy. And if the medicals check out, I could see him even going a little higher than this. TCU's Mike Miles has officially declared for the NBA draft after a very good junior season. Despite being a smaller guard, he's really talented, still super young for a three-year college player. He can create for himself and others. He competes defensively. I think he's worth a second round selection with the improvements that he made this year. You pretty much know what you're getting with James Naji, an athletic energy big who's been playing with Barcelona in the ACB in the Euro League. It'll be interesting to see how teams value a player with his skill set. I don't know how much else he's going to do in the future, but he's got the potential to make an impact. And even though it has been limited minutes, he still has brought that energy as a young pro. Jalen Wilson ended his KU career as a first team All-American, a 2022 national champion, and apparently they plan on retiring his jersey, which is an amazing honor to have. He stepped up big time for them, and even though they didn't get to where they wanted, he proved his draft status. While I still question what he's great at, he may just look better in a role that's rescaled back and proved to be a valuable rotation player in the end. Andre Jackson is too dynamic an athlete, playmaker, and defender to not get an opportunity in the league. He was pretty ridiculous in UConn's title run and even in his limited shooting and half-court offense abilities, he makes too many plays and does too many other little things to write him off. And even when the stat sheet didn't always show it, you could see his impact immediately. The cross, kick, Jackson. I don't know if he'll leave UCLA this year, but Amari Bailey had some moments in the second half of the season and especially in postseason play that made me reconsider some things in this draft. He was active on defense, showed more in terms of his shot and creation, and was poised in the big moments. Ultimately, if he were to leave, he'd be a solid pick in the second. Moving Amari Bailey from the corner. Creighton's Trey Alexander made big plays down the stretch and had an excellent sophomore season for the Blue Jays. I really like his game as an off guard who can get his own shot, especially in the pick and roll. He knocks down threes and competes defensively. He'll need to keep working physically, but I think he gets drafted whenever he decides. Alexander, baseline fatal. 
You look at the stat sheet and you might not always see it, but you'll never miss the type of impact that Jordan Walsh can have on a game when you're watching. He's got potential shutdown wing qualities and all he really needs is a decent three point shot to be in someone's rotation. Now that might take some time, but he's young, he's got great physical tools, made a few impressive plays from time to time offensively. And with all that in mind, I consider him as early as the late first round in this class. And if he returns to Arkansas, he'd be in my first round coming into the next draft. Jaime Hawkins has been a staple in college basketball for the last few years and took some steps forward this season. He's an interesting combo forward who always seemed to make a play in every way that UCLA needed it. And though I've got some questions about where he best fits defensively and in his shot, he's one of those guys who's just good at basketball and could end up figuring it out. I really enjoy Brandon Paul Zimski's game, the way he finds a way to make things happen using his pace, craft, and manipulating ball screens. He's also got a great floater game, he shot the three in an elite rate, he was ridiculous on the glass. He can play, but with him gaining like top 20 traction, I worry about how big he actually is. He's not the best athlete, but otherwise I still like him as a late first, early second round guy. Indiana's Trace Jackson Davis was one of the three to five best players in the country the entire year and improved in ways I didn't think he could at this point in his career. While I'm not there with the first round stamp, he's got a clear path as a contributor. He's athletic, he can help protect the rim, he can really pass it now, and though it'll be much different than anything that he did in college, he's got production and tools worth betting on. Syracuse's Judah Mintz has declared for the draft while maintaining his eligibility. He's an impressive scoring combo guard who gets after it defensively, and while he could benefit from staying another year in college, especially being in that 24 class, he's already in that late first, early second round range for me, and I'm a buyer of his talent long term. Duke will get a second crack at it though. They're on top by one. A lot of turnovers early, and Mintz with the special. It absolutely will not be. You talk about football. Jaquavion Smith didn't quite have the season we hoped for coming in, but that upside as an electric combo guard score is still 100% there. He'll need to really keep working on his body and in his decision making, but he's got the ability to fill it up quickly and make plays, and you saw him really show it against a very tough Creighton team in the first round of the tourney. I think I've been a little low on Marcus Sasser for most of the year. He is still an older, smaller guard, but he can play and doesn't have too many glaring weaknesses. You could feel the difference in those Houston teams when he was both out and playing banged up, and I just think his impact is worth betting on somewhere in his range. Sasser hit his last three. Ricky Council IV was a great get for Arkansas transfer from Wichita State, but I didn't think he'd be as good as he was. He consistently showed off his elite athleticism, ability to get to and finish at the bucket. He created a lot of shots for himself on the perimeter and though he'll need to keep working on the spot up game and just playing .5 basketball, he's got all the NBA tools. This club. Council one on one, pull up. Julian Strother hit one of the most confident game winning shots against UCLA that I can remember and really just the way that he played down the stretch of the season gave me confidence in him as a contributor. You don't need him to do too much, just knock down threes, get to the floater off the closeout or on the move. He gets out in transition and runs, he can be solid defensively. It's a great skill set in that late first round range and I'm excited to see where he ends up landing. I was actually more and more impressed by Noah Clowney's defensive versatility over the year. And as a young big who can really cover ground and protect the rim, I think he should land in the first round. I'm a buyer of his shot, but it'll have a say in his overall success offensively. Long term, it'll be interesting to see where he's at his best, whether that's the four or the five, but he's a really solid prospect. UConn's Donovan Klingon was a huge part of their championship run this year, and while he's been a guy I've penciled in for next year, he's done enough in the last month or so for me to really consider him as a guy in this class. I think he would benefit from staying, getting more reps, handling bigger minutes, and navigating the foul game, but his combination of size, rim protection, and finishing ability make him an easy long-term value pick for a team, and with the success of a guy like Walker Kessler, he'll have plenty of suitors. It'll ultimately just be up to him and his comfort making that jump. It'll be interesting to see if Bilal Koulibaly actually declares this year with being a lottery pick in 2024 potentially on the horizon. He's still a bit raw offensively and didn't quite keep up some of the production flashes that he showed at times with Mets 92, but a 6'6 wing that's as athletic as he is can defend and make plays in the ways that he can. It's hard for me to not see him landing in the first round range this year already. Xavier's Kobe Jones finally took that jump in his junior season and will likely have gotten himself into that first round of the draft, potentially even into the top 20. 
He's an all-around threat at 6'5", 6'6". He's strong. He can shoot the three. Proved a lot there this season. He defends. He does the dirty work. And I feel like he's going to make a team like Memphis, Sacramento, or Indiana look really smart on draft night. Kyle Filipowski was probably Duke's most consistent player this year, and he impressed me after having relatively lower expectations coming in. Now, I do have some questions in his game still though. I am a buyer in his shot long term, which is why I still like him in the first round, but it's going to be tougher if he doesn't improve there. Defensively, I'm not sure where he fits, though he's a much better mover on that end than I anticipated. Regardless, he's still a highly skilled seven footer that can make it happen, but those things are always on my mind when considering him. Leonard Miller produced at a very high level in the G League this year and did it in a few ways. He often served as that play finisher, a role that I didn't think he could play as well as he did. And he's still a tougher evaluation in terms of like what role he plays at the next level than I guess his raw numbers would suggest, but his movement, upside with the ball, and impact on both ends of the floor put him in that first round range. Ryan Rupert is a prospect I'll be following pretty closely over the next couple seasons. He's a 6'7 wing with a 7'3 wingspan and can defend at a very high level, but everything else is still kind of a work in progress in a way that does give me some pause. However, he's still got a clear path as a potential contributor. It's just about what caliber that is that I've been going back and forth on. Chris Murray finished the season averaging 20 points, 8 rebounds, and 2 assists with a block and a steal as a 6'8 forward. Now while it wasn't quite what Keegan did both in terms of production and efficiency, it was a huge year for him and he's just a solid player across the board. I think his 3 point shot should still be the focus for him but he's someone who will likely find his way into a rotation quickly and it might even be on his twins team. Gigi Jackson remains one of the more interesting prospects in this draft, and I honestly don't really know where to rank him at this point. You can clearly see the high upside for a guy who is, for example, two months younger than guys like Bronny James and Isaiah Collier. But the way that this season went, I just have a lot of questions about his ability to contribute beyond making tough shots. But even saying that, that's still a gamble. I think is worth it in this range, and hopefully he ends up in a great situation and environment that can get the best out of him. Second, Jackson, a sort of the retired CD Sissoko looked like the Ignite's best prospect down the stretch of the year. He's a 6'8 wing slash guard who started to get downhill with a lot more regularity. He can make plays for others. I have a lot less questions about the shot now, and I think he might still be underrated as an 18-year-old who did this against pros. The other way, Sissoko behind his back for me. Derek Lively eventually became most of the guy that we expected coming into the year, being a prolific rim protector and someone mobile enough to cover ground on the perimeter. He's pretty much solely a play finisher offensively and when they couldn't get him a dunk he simply didn't score. And unless he shoots the three that'll probably continue to be the case but he's got a clear niche, improved his value as a first round pick in my mind. Pepperdine's Max Lewis is one of my favorite players in this class, and as I revisit everybody's game, his tools are continuing to stand out in comparison to others. Now, he's got to be a lot better and more consistent defensively, but a 6'7 wing who had the flashes he had as a scorer, shooter, and athlete put him in his range, and he might even end up higher on this list for me when June rolls around. A third and final UConn Husky on his board, Jordan Hawkins ended up being the best pro prospect standing in a weird tournament, and he was key in igniting them offensively in a lot of ways. Like I said before, I do like Max Lewis, but Hawkins might be my favorite player to watch in this class. The footwork and ability that he has as a movement shooter is second to none. He can put it on the floor some and was solid defensively. He's another guy who's going to need to continue making progress physically, but I like his game a lot and he'll provide value in the league with his elite skill. Nick Smith Jr. has been one of the tougher, if not the toughest guy to evaluate in this class, and unless you're ignoring his entire college season, I don't really see the mid-lottery pick case anymore. As a scoring combo guard, he struggled to create a ton of good looks on a perimeter. He was heavily reliant on that floater, and his defense left a lot to be desired down the stretch. He is still a talented player, and I have faith in him regaining some of what we saw prior to Arkansas, but the threshold for his archetype is so high, it's hard to be super confident in that. I'm still a believer in Dariq Whitehead. I was very impressed by how well he shot the ball and adapted to a complimentary role through the injuries. He's still young enough to be in high school right now and if he can get some sustained health and attack those workouts, he could continue to climb up boards. It was tough to evaluate him as well this year through the injuries, but I do think he's a guy whose upside is still worth betting on. 
To me, Jed Howard has become underrated over the last couple months. A 6A dude who can shoot it and has upside as a creator should be enough to keep from falling to the late first round on boards and mocks. I understand why people have soured on him to an extent. The defense got worse, kind of lining up with his injuries, and when he wasn't hitting shots, he could go missing, but I still think there's enough there to keep him in his range. For three, and high of the game, we're 29 apiece, jumper Howard. After the wild breakout Purdue game, Jalen Hushafino wasn't amazing, but he still showed why he had elevated his stock as a top 20 guy. He's pretty well-rounded, a talented passer, can get to his mid-range with ease, has great pace in the pick and roll, and can defend. I do think the shooting is still a work in progress as well as his ability to get downhill and create separation, but he's a very good player and one a team is going to be very happy in selecting. Kobe Bufkin was a late season riser for me and for good reason. He's a well-rounded guard who can really defend, he can shoot it, make plays. He's just a very good prospect overall. And he's another guy who has a lot to work on physically still and I wonder what caliber shooter he'll be but other than that I'm confident in what he brings to the table. That man shot 71% at the rim on 121 attempts this year which is pretty much Donovan Klingon numbers who is 7'2", mind you. That always stands out to me when I look at his synergy profile, but anyways, I still think he's a little undervalued and will probably be in more lotto conversations as the year goes on. Keontae George kind of limped to the finish line this season, both literally and figuratively, and it hurt his stock some. I do think he's still got real upside as a shot maker and playmaker, even with the inefficiency, and hopefully he'll head back to where he was defensively earlier in the year too. I think he should still maintain lotto buzz, and in the right situation, he could really pop. Anthony Black is another guy that can be tough to rank, but I am an overall fan of what he brings to the table. A 6'7 guard who can pass it, really defend, and at times be very impactful driving to the bucket is a solid base to have. I often come back to Josh Giddy when thinking about him as a player. AB shot even looks strangely similar, and they had very similar questions as prospects. Now Giddy's in another stratosphere as a passer in my opinion. AB has a clear edge defensively, but I think that's partially the vision for him and obviously Giddy has made an early impact in his career. Grady Dick officially declared for the draft on ESPN last week, and even with a somewhat disappointing end to March Madness in a loss against Arkansas, he should be locked in as a lottery pick. A 6'8 wing shooter who can get to the dribble pull up, makes good decisions, and holds his own defensively is the type of player every team wants. The creation will ultimately decide his ceiling, but I think he has a pretty safe floor and should make an impact fairly quickly. As things have gotten clear, I've grown even more confidence in Bryce sends the ball than before. The shot making talent and efficiency that he showed mixed with some underrated playmaking flashes as a 6'6 wing put him in this range for me. I am a bit concerned defensively, but he might just be good enough on O to make up for it. And for now, I think he's a lottery pick that could continue to rock. Taylor Hendricks has been a consistent riser for me and I think he's here to stay in this mid to late lottery range. He's listed at 6'9", but he actually looks much taller. He's someone who is super impactful defensively, protecting the rim and being able to move on a perimeter. He can space the floor and while that creation has a ways to go, I don't know if it'll ever be a huge part of his game. I'm confident in what he does well translating and being highly valuable at the next level. There's a conversation to be had with what level he reaches as a creator, but Case and Wallace is going to contribute at a high level in the NBA. He's a terrific defender, he showed he can knock down a spot up, he's a solid passer, has good size, he just checks a lot of boxes and really showed his impact in that last game against Kansas State. I think he'll probably end up the best traditional guard outside of Scoot for me and could be a steal if he goes late lottery like he's often projected. This is roughly what I consider the third tier right now, but even then there's a decent group of players behind him I think could still end up in this sort of range. This next tier though is the one that feels much clearer to me than any time before. Asar Thompson comes in at number 7, though he could very well end up at number 5 for me. Asar ended his OTE career on a game winning 3. He was named MVP of the finals for a second straight year and consistently showed off his elite athleticism, improved shot, and potentially elite defense. He's also a solid playmaker and when you combine all of that, you've got a prospect with a super high ceiling and a floor that I think is a little higher than he's been given credit. Full court pass, Asar! Seven wings. <laughs> 
Jarius Walker asserted himself as one of the better prospects this class has to offer. His defensive upside is the base of his game as a 6'8", 6'9", forward with a 7'2", wingspan. But he also had plenty of moments putting the ball on the floor, making plays for others, knocking down threes, and even having some creation flashes on the perimeter. Now all that offensive stuff besides the playmaking is probably going to be a long term play, but the total package of things that he has, the physical attributes, he's also a likely lock for the top 7 or 8 of the draft at this point too. Kim Wilmore is a ridiculous athlete and a power creator who showed upside as a shooter and creating looks on the perimeter. He was also solid defensively, particularly on the ball, and he's just another super young prospect whose upside I'm consistently impressed by. I do find myself hesitating with his ability to read the floor. He also falls down a ton. I haven't quite figured that out yet, but there's a potential star in there, and it should keep him in the top seven or eight of this draft. Now Brandon Miller had a rough ending in the tournament to what was a very good freshman season. He was dealing with a groin injury and I think that should be remembered, but also some of the same concerns that we saw during the year showed up, even slightly before he got injured. Regardless, I think he solidified himself as a top 5 pick and a guy I think can make a super high impact at the next level. It's hard to go wrong with a 6'9 player who is as effective from deep as he is, can make plays and be solid defensively, and if it breaks right creation wise, he could be an all star wing. If you want a little more detail on his game we just dropped his scatter report so go check that out if you haven't already. I still think Amin Thompson has some special traits as an athlete, playmaker, and driver that you just can't teach or find often. Of course the shot is going to be the game changer for him but if he gets in the right situation he could very well end up the second best player in his class. That's where his upside is to me and that's keeping him comfortably in his range. Right, I'll see you guys. Appreciate it. Here you've got multifaceted wing sized guys who can make a play in multiple spots on the floor and outside of Brandon Miller should be plus athletes as 19, 20 year olds. And though we may split this against some in the future towards the top, this feels like that next group in terms of projection and upside. And coming in at number two, we still have Scoot Henderson. I think the conversation around the number two pick would have been a little different had he played on ESPN three times a week like some others. And he himself battled injuries all year too that don't get really talked about. But he still performed even as he didn't catch a rhythm or was as efficient as we would have liked to see him be. Still a tremendous athlete who can make plays and already made great progress as a shooter in his second year as a pro at just 19. And he's pretty much locked in at number two for me. And of course, at number one, we have Victor Wimbanyama. Again, you know, we're running out of things to say and talk about with him. The man got a put back off his own three point miss that he created off the dribble. And he continues to show that his upside is just unfathomably high. He's got the potential to be dominant on both ends of the floor and in ways that we just haven't seen. And the way that he could potentially bend defenses and attract attention is truly like some top 10 player ever type of stuff. And with the insight that we have on his work ethic and attention to detail, that's something I'm comfortable in saying as wild as it might sound for a 19 year old, but he is truly, truly different. I appreciate y'all for watching this video. If you did enjoy, please be sure to leave a like, subscribe if you are new around here, and leave a comment down below of your thoughts on the board, who you like a little more, who you like a little less, everything in between. Let me know in the comments down below. As always, I'm Keandre, this is Swoop Intellect. Until next time, I'm out.